Good afternoon. Once again, we come together to sit under the preaching, and we thank the Lord that he provides us this opportunity for a second time today. On behalf of the consistory and deacons, we extend a warm welcome to all, including all guests. Consistory has no additional announcements further to what was announced this morning. The collection in this service is for the work of the deacons in their ministry of mercy. Leading us in worship this afternoon is Dr. Van Vliet. Dr. Van Vliet, we welcome you here in our midst. We also pray for God's blessing over us this afternoon as you lead us in this service. May we be spiritually edified through the preaching and may our Lord's name be glorified in our worship. Brothers and sisters, please rise as we worship the Lord our God. As we come into the presence of our holy and most awesome God, we confess our dependence upon him with these words, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Receive now also his greeting. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let's praise our God in song, Psalm 46, the stanzas one, two, and five.
We just sang, brothers and sisters, the Lord will to her, it's the people of God, the church, will to her help appear when at the break of day he draws near. It was at the break of day, it was the very earliest glimmer of the dawn that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ arose from the grave for the completion of our salvation. And so let us sing and so profess our faith in the risen Savior, the eternal Father, and the Holy Spirit, our one true and triune God, sing the words of the Apostles' Creed, hymn one. Let us pray to the Lord our God, asking his blessing on our worship this afternoon. Our Father in heaven, you have gathered us here, and we thank you for this, to praise you, the one true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are ever so grateful, and we pray that through the power of your Spirit in accordance with your word, you would make us more thankful for all that you have given us in him, the Son, the Son of God, the only begotten, eternal, natural Son of God. In him who is the Christ, our prophet, our high priest, our eternal king. In him who is our head and our bridegroom. We thank you for everything that he is and has done, is doing, and will yet do for us. Father in heaven, this afternoon you set before us his name, his personal, powerful, and blessed name, the name above every name, the name of Jesus. And we ask, Father in heaven, that as we consider what you have revealed about this name, 
that it may not only be for us interesting things to learn, but that we may find in this name the salvation that we desperately need. O Lord, help us to see more and more that we need a rescuer, that we need a redeemer, that we need a savior, someone who will not just help us along a little bit, but rescue us from the pit. We thank you that he who willingly gave himself to be crucified and die on a cross, that even as he willingly went forward to that great sacrifice, so we thank you that he came up from the tomb, out of the tomb, and stepped forward to new and glorious life, taking us with him and bringing us into the new life that he had obtained. Father in heaven, we're now about to turn to your word, and in reading it, hearing it, proclaiming it, receiving it, we are in need of the spirit of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that he who inspired the words that we are about to read would also take them and plant them deeply in our hearts, that we may bear the fruit of faith, the fruit of the Spirit, to the full glory of your holy name. In the name of our High Priest Jesus Christ we ask, Amen. Brothers and sisters, I've been asked to focus on the truth of God's word concerning the name Jesus, as this is summarized in Lord's Day 11. In connection with this, we're going to read two passages from the Old Testament. The children here may have heard at a certain time at home or in school or both that the Old Testament equivalent of the name Jesus is Joshua. One is Hebrew, one is Greek, but they have exactly the same meaning. Joshua, Jesus, the Lord saves, the Savior. We're first going to read about Joshua, son of Nun. Joshua 1, the verses 1 through 9. And then we'll read about another Joshua, lesser known one in Zechariah chapter 6. But first Joshua 1, 1 through 9. Let's listen to God's word. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then we hear a lot more about 
that Joshua in the book that has his name, Joshua. But later on in the Old Testament, almost at the end, Zechariah, second last, second last book of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Prophecy of Zechariah, chapter six, verse nine. And there we hear about another Joshua. Joshua, not the son of Nun, but the son of Jehozadak. We're going to read the verses nine through 15. The word of the Lord came to me, take from the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon and go, the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and he shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, Tobijah, Jediah, and Chain, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Let's rise, if able, and sing Psalm 100, all stanzas.
Let's now read the summary of the Word of God that we together confess in Lord's Day 11. The first Lord's Day in the section or subsection, God the Son and our Redemption. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, that is, Savior? Because he saves us from all our sins, and because salvation is not to be sought or found in anyone else. To those who seek their salvation or well-being, in saints, in themselves, or anywhere else, also believe in the only Savior, Jesus? No. Though they boast of him in words, they in fact deny the only Savior, Jesus. For one of two things must be true. Either Jesus is not a complete Savior, or those who by true faith accept this Savior must find in him all that is necessary for their salvation. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, today, as you well know, as you also commemorated this morning, it is Easter Sunday, the day that we, in particular, commemorate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this afternoon, we're focusing on that name, Jesus. And that draws us back to the time when he was conceived and born, because like the rest of us, that's when he received this name, Jesus. So the day in the calendar of the church and the Lord's Day from the Catechism pull together his conception and birth, what we remember at Christmas time, and Easter Sunday. And what pulls together is the name that was chosen by God for that child, that special, unique, holy child. It's not the way that it normally goes. Normally, it's the earthly parents who pick the name. And the dad and the mom, when a new baby is being expected, they will think about it, talk about it, and maybe they will choose a name because that name is in the family. There's some grandpa or grandma who has that name as well. Or perhaps they've looked in a book or some website online and they really like the meaning of that name. And so that becomes the name of the little girl or the little boy. Or sometimes it's just, well, that name sounds so good. Maybe the first name and the second name sound so good together. Those are all kinds of considerations that go into name choice by earthly parents. But the mother of our Lord, Mary, and Joseph, her betrothed husband, did not pick the name Jesus. In fact, even before Jesus was conceived in the womb of his mother Mary, the Lord sent an angel, special angel, Gabriel, to come to Mary to make the announcement that she was going to conceive, that she was going to have a baby, even though she was not yet married, fully married to Joseph, they were betrothed. And the angel said, when this baby is born, the name has been picked by heaven. His name shall be Jesus. And then a little bit later on, when Mary was expecting, and Joseph found out about that and thought that he might divorce her quietly, as the scripture says, the Lord sent another angel and said, Joseph, don't do that. 
Take Mary as your wife. And at the same time, that angel repeated the name and said, the name of this baby must be Jesus. There's no discussion here. There's no alternatives. His name will be Jesus. And why did the Father in heaven insist that this baby's name would be Jesus? Well, we learn the full significance later on. Acts chapter 4, verse 11, when the apostle Peter explains it this way, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is, here it comes, no other name under heaven, and there are a lot of names under heaven, lots of names of lots of other people, but there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This one, Jesus, is the only one. And that's the gospel that I may proclaim to you this afternoon on Easter Sunday. Jesus means, apart from me, there is no other Savior. We're first of all going to look at the Old Covenant background to this special name, and then secondly, the whole, complete, entire, all-inclusive blessing that is inside that name. So first of all, the Old Covenant background. As mentioned, Jesus is the same name as Joshua, one Hebrew, Joshua, one Greek, Jesus. But there are about five Joshua's in the Old Testament. There are two that we know more about. The first one is Joshua, son of Nun, and the Lord reveals him to be a soldier, a commander of God's armies. As we'll see, he's also an inheritance distributor. And then there's the other Joshua, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, much later on in the Old Testament, and he was from the priestly family, son of high priest, and he starts to receive, this is really quite remarkable, royal honor. He's got a crown on his head. What can we learn about our Savior through these Old Testament Joshua's that the Lord teaches us about. First of all, Joshua, son of Nun. Yes, he was a soldier. He was an army commander in addition to being Moses' helper, assistant. And that became clear already when the people were coming up out of the land of Egypt, but before they came to the promised land, about halfway there, at Rephidim, an army, an army of the Amalekites came out. These were aggressive, these were vicious people, and they were out to stop and annihilate God's people, the Israelites. And the children here perhaps remember the history well. There is Moses, the servant of the Lord, and where is he? He's up on the hill, and he's praying. He's praying for the Lord's help and strength against this attacking army. But while Moses is up on the hill with his hands being lifted up, praying, there's another man who's down on the battlefield. That's Joshua. Joshua is the one with the sword in his hand. Joshua is the one who's saying to the rest of the soldiers, come, we must face the Amalekites. And you see, you need people like that. Because there is such a thing as battle, as war. Now we should never, ever take war lightly. It's horrible, at times horrific, it's painful, it's frightening. Lives are lost and people are injured. But there are battles and there need to be soldiers and soldiers need a commander, and that's who Joshua, son of Nun, was. He didn't stay up on the hill. He went to face the enemy, and it wasn't just at Rephidim. It wasn't just against the Amalekites. We read about that in Joshua chapter 1, 
when Moses, the servant of the Lord, has died and Joshua, son of Nun, is going to take over, then the Lord says to him, now go over, go over the river Jordan and face the nations on the other side. You're going to have to face the Hittites. And among the larger group of the Hittites are all the other ites that you hear about in the Bible. The Hivites, the Jebusites, the Edomites, the Amorites. And nation by nation and fighting army by fighting army. It's Joshua, the commander in chief, who will have to take sword in hand and battlefield after battlefield after battlefield. He's the one who has to say, come on now, soldiers. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord is with us. Let's go forward to the battlefield. As frightening as that may have been. And when you think of who Joshua the son of Nun was, and then you realize, brothers and sisters, that Joshua is just another way of saying Jesus, it's not right away easy to follow the line, is it? When we hear that name, Jesus, we think of the baby laid in the manger. We think of him who grew up and was preaching and teaching to the huge crowds, having compassion on their sick, having compassion on the hungry, feeding them, healing them. We think of him who is the Lamb of God, who willingly went to be sacrificed on the cross of Golgotha. All these things, the baby in the manger, the one who healed the sick, the one who taught the crowds, the one who was crucified on the cross, the one who rose from the tomb. We think of all of these things when we hear that name Jesus, but war, battles, swords, commander in chief, is that our Jesus? We may think, no, that's different. Until we read the book of Revelation. And there, the Apostle John receives a vision of the risen Jesus, and he's described as the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe, a golden sash around his chest. His feet were like burnished bronze, his voice like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. A sword. Jesus is also a warrior. He has a sword. Except it's not a sword in his hand. It's a sword in his mouth. It is a sword meant for a battle. It's sharp. This is not a museum piece. Sometimes you go to a museum and you see a sword hanging on the wall or in the case. It's not sharpened, perhaps, for war. This one's sharp. It's double-edged. It is a sword for battle. And it is in the mouth of Jesus. Because, brothers and sisters, he is, in addition to everything else, also our commander-in-chief. Only his kingdom is not the kingdom of this world, and therefore he does not battle like the kingdoms of this world battle, not with rifles, not with tanks, not with fighter jets or cruise missiles, but with the word of the gospel, the word that comes forth from the mouth of Jesus Christ, comes onto the pages of scripture, and then is coming through the voice of the preachers. This is how Jesus, our commander in chief, battles against the enemies, like temptation. Temptation, brothers and sisters, is not an annoyance. God is an annoyance. 
But so much more than that. Temptations in our life are not like a swarm of mosquitoes that you want to swat away, or even a swarm of black flies that want to take a bite of your flesh from your arm or your ear. Temptation is like an army, an army of warriors lined up against us with the army's chief, the devil, the chief tempter. And who, we all are dealing with temptations, but who, brothers and sisters, I ask you, is going to be the commander in chief? Are you standing there on the battlefield? Just you and the opposing army of all the temptations that come your way? No. Jesus, our commander in chief, the Joshua of the new covenant, he is the one who goes into battle before us. Not with the weapons of war that the armies of this world use, but with the announcement that he has set us free from the power of the devil through his precious blood that he shed on the cross, Good Friday. Announcing that the spirit whom he sent, once he ascended into heaven, is now dwelling in our hearts to strengthen us, to make us courageous, so that we can also say in the face of temptation, I will not be afraid, I will not be dismayed. The spirit of Jesus is poured out within me. This is how our Joshua fights for us. Another enemy is sin, closely related, of course, temptation and sin. But sin, brothers and sisters, is not just a mistake. It's not just a, oops, I did something wrong in the sight of God again. It is that, but it is so much more. Sin, you have to realize, is like an enemy. Sometimes we talk about fighting a disease, like cancer. Well, sin is something that just goes inside of us, heart, soul, and mind. And one sin leads to the other sin, leads to the other sin. It's like the most fatal disease that has overtaken humankind. And who's going to be the one to battle the disease of sin. Is it just you and I doing the best that we can as feeble human beings? No. Jesus is our New Testament Joshua. He's the commander in chief. And he has taken the enemy's sin to the cross. And as it says in Colossians, he's nailed that enemy to the cross. There gaining the victory over sin. One more enemy, death. Death is not, as we hear all around us, death is not a natural part of life. Death is, as the scriptures say, the last enemy. And it is a formidable enemy. But do we just have to face this foe all alone? No. Jesus, our risen Savior, the one who came out of the tomb, victorious over death, he is the one who gives us victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? You have no victory, death, in Jesus Christ. And so when we realize who Joshua, son of Nun, really was, then we see more and more who our Jesus of the new covenant is, including the fact that after the battles had been won, Joshua went on to another task. If you would read through the entire book of Joshua, just looking through it, you would discover, brothers and sisters, that after about 12 chapters of battles, then in chapter 13, the book starts to turn, and we read about boundaries. Because the Lord, through Joshua, son of Nun, gave this part of the land flowing with milk and honey to the tribe of Judah. And he gave this part of the land filled with milk and honey and so many other blessings to Zebulun, and this to Naphtali, and that to Issachar. Tribe by tribe, family by family, the Lord said, here is your parcel of the blessings. Here is your parcel of the undeserved blessings. And this too, 
is what our Joshua does as well. See, brothers and sisters, right now, even though we have the victory in Jesus Christ, the battle goes on, but the battle does not go on forever. There's a land that's better than the land flowing with milk and honey waiting for us on the other side of the Jordan of this current era. And that's the new creation, the new heavens, the new earth. And it's this same Joshua of the new covenant, the risen Jesus, who will one day give us our portion, portion, our parcel of the glorious land that is to be. Yes, the battle rages now, but one day the bounty will be divided among us. And that's just Joshua, son of Nun. Then the Lord tells us there's another Joshua. And there's something very, very striking about this Joshua, son of Jehozadak, who's the high priest. So then his son is the next high priest. But the Lord comes to Zechariah and also these exiles then through Zechariah and says, make a crown. Take some silver, some gold, and make a crown for this priest. What? Crown for a priest? Priest wore a turban and with a special gold plate, holy to the Lord, but priests didn't wear crowns. Kings wore crowns. And there's nothing mixed up here because the Lord knows exactly what he's saying. This priest shall bear royal honor, verse 13, and he shall sit and rule on his throne. But a priest is supposed to be by the altar. But you see, brothers and sisters, here's where it all comes together. It used to be that the priest had his task in the temple, offering the sacrifices, also the prayers with the incense smoke, and the king had another task. He was over there, sitting on the throne, ruling over the people, protecting the people, making sure they had the food and everything else. Priest over here doing his task, king over there doing his task. But already in Jehozadak, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, it starts to come together. We see a priest who is also a king. And this Joshua then becomes our Jesus. The priest king after the order of Melchizedek. Do you need a sacrifice for all of your sins? Go to this Jesus. But do you, do you need someone who will take your prayers and bring them before God, purify them, strengthen them along the way as needed? Go to this priest, Jesus. But do you need a king? Who will defend you? Go to this same Jesus. Do you need someone who will provide all that you need for body and soul? Go to this Jesus. Already in the Old Testament, but now so much more in the New. He and he alone is the only one. You don't need Joshua or Jesus plus someone else, plus someone else, plus someone else, plus someone else. You just need him. And that is so special. It's so unique. I ask you, where else in life do you find something that is really, truly all-inclusive? Some things advertise as all-inclusive. Maybe you've seen that. All-inclusive vocation. Your flights there are covered, your hotel is covered, your food is covered. Even if the restaurant needs to have a tip, the gratuities are covered. It's all-inclusive, it says. Unless you're careful enough to read the fine print and you read all the small print, oh yeah, but that's actually not included in the all-inclusive. There are no other things in life that are truly 
all inclusive. And we know that. Take something so simple as owning and driving a car. How many different names do you need to keep your car or your truck or your van on the road? You need the name of someone, some dealership, who's going to sell you the vehicle. Then you need the name of a gas station because you need to fill it up with gas. You need the name of a good mechanic because the thing is going to break down sooner or later. You need the name of an insurance company. You need the name of Service Ontario because you have to have that car registered. And so it goes on and on and on. Just to keep a little car on the road, you need how many names? Five, six, seven, eight, more? You see, everything in this life, it takes name upon name, name after name, except the most important thing of all in life, as the Catechism says it, salvation and well-being. And there, there's but one name, one person, Jesus. And no one and nothing else beside him. Not another saint or saints or many, many saints. The Roman Catholic Church, last count that I saw, says that there are more than 10,000 names beside the name of Jesus. 10,000 saints. Here's a few. Saint Anne, Saint Joachim, Saint Gregory the Great, Saint John, connected to health and the ambulance. There's all kinds of different names, thousands upon thousands. And the Roman Catholic Church teaches the name Jesus, but then for all of these other things, like the footnotes, this saint, that saint, that saint. No, says the Apostle Peter, no other name, just one. So that means not your name either. It means not my name either. It's not Jesus plus me. And then fill in your own personal name. And you may say, yeah, but that's obvious. I knew that already. Yes, me, we know it. We may confess it. We may even boast in the name but we have to see, brothers and sisters, where the rubber meets the road, as we sometimes say. Because you know how it goes? We, we know it, we confess, and we hear it from the pulpit, and we say it to each other, Jesus saves us from all our sins. And then we step forward in life, and for 98%, 99% of our sins, we say, Jesus is the name. Forgiveness in him alone. But then there's that 1%. Maybe it's only half a percent. But it's that one or two or three sins in our life that we feel so horrible about, so terribly guilty. Why, why, why did I ever do that? And we carry it. And we carry it month after month, and year after year, and decade after decade, we carry that sin on our own shoulders as if me could somehow deal with that one sin. The name Jesus means apart from him, there is no other savior. And that's not you, and that's not me, for the half percent either. Or this is also what we sometimes do. All the sins, we even try to be very consistent about it, all the 100% of sins that I've committed, 
that I've done wrong, that I can say I did it wrong in the eyes of the Lord. They're all forgiven, including that big one that I feel so terrible about, but, and there's all those things that I didn't do what was wrong, but the point is, I didn't do what is right. I didn't do what I ought to have done. They're all the gaps in my life, the gaps of parents who look back, or maybe they're right in the midst of raising children, and they say, I should have done that as a dad, and I should have done that as a mom, and I should have, and I should have, and I should have, and I should have. And we feel it within the communion of saints. There are all these needs among us here in Dunville too. And I should do that and I should visit that person and I should and I should and I should. Office bearers, office bearers feel this acutely. I should make that visit and I should go and talk to that and I should have said when we made the family visit that. And it's all these gaps in our lives Lack of full obedience, lack of doing what we ought to do. And then what do we do? We try harder. We try harder. And we try to fill it in. And we try to compensate. We try to compensate more. And we try to compensate more. But what are we doing, brothers and sisters? On the one hand, we come and we praise the name Jesus. But then for all of those things that we ought to do, but for whatever sinful reason we don't get around to doing, we put the name me in there. And I'll do better tomorrow in order to make up for what I didn't do today. That is an offense to our Savior, Jesus. He not only died on the cross for the full forgiveness of our sins, but he also lived a perfect life of obedience from conception through to last breath. And he did that all for you. He did that all for me. The fullness of his salvation is both forgiveness for the sins that we commit and the perfect obedience in the place of the things that we omit. It's all covered in him. And should we do better tomorrow? In the strength of the Lord, yes. But that's out of thankfulness. That's not out of trying to somehow put all the names together and make up a complete salvation. The name Jesus, the perfect Savior who did it all. He's the one whom we confess. Not Jesus and me. Jesus. Period. Exclamation mark. Thank you, O Lord. Who says, I, even I am the Lord. Apart from me, there is no other Savior. This is the one we confess. Amen. Let us sing. Hymn 84.
Let us pray. O Lord of Lords, thank you for infinite love. Thank you for infinite love expressed in the beloved, your Son, Jesus, the Savior, the Christ. Father in heaven, what a wonder it is. And yes, the angels sing the praises and so we should join in right with them. For, O oh Lord, the redemption that you have worked for us, such a miracle, such a unique thing, so complete, so perfect, so flawless in every way. Thank you that we do not have to dash here and there, run from one name to the next to the next, trying somehow, furiously, to cobble together salvation. Oh Lord, there are so many in this world who are doing precisely that, going from the name of one God to the next, going to the name of one guru to the next, going to the name of one spiritual teacher to the next, going to the name of this person and that person and this movement and that offer of help. We pray, would you bring to them the name all victorious, the name all glorious, the wonder-filling name, Jesus, the only Savior. And would you then bless the work of mission, both here in our own area and beyond. Would you bless the proclamation of your word from this pulpit and from pulpits throughout this world. May that proclamation be pure. May it not become mixed with all kinds of human ideas or ideologies, but may it come straight from the truth that you have revealed. We therefore also pray for the work on calling a preacher, pastor, teacher for this congregation. Father in heaven, may it be blessed, may it be guided by the spirit of him, our risen Savior, so that in your time and in your way, the man of your choosing for this congregation may also be found and installed, ordained. O Lord, we pray that you would grant your special blessing upon all those who are involved in this in a particular way, the calling committee, the council. Grant all of us as congregation patience. It's not always easy either, Father in heaven, and so we pray for this. We also ask that in our lives, your name, which is the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together as triune God, may be honored and praised by us, but also through us. This we pray in the name of our High Priest, our Priest King, Jesus. Amen. You now have opportunity to give Christian alms, and after the deacons have gathered that, let's rise, if able, and sing hymn 23.
Receive now the blessing of the Lord and go on your way in his peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.